how good is this? This is just such an amazing place. This is a passion project put together by a couple of real enthusiasts and it's called the Great British Car Journey. Now, bear in mind we've been through lockdown and COVID. Uh, a lot of people have spent a lot of time doing some amazing things to put together an interactive display of the best of British for you to enjoy. And it's housed in this amazing building and there are some fabulous cars here and I can't wait to guide you through it. When you turn up, you'll be greeted at the door with one of these. This is a, an interactive guide that's gonna take you through the whole exhibition and you tap on individual cars or the car's got QR codes and then it tells you the history of the car plus the little side stories and you can delve even deeper if you want to into the stories or the backstories behind those vehicles. So that's an amazing thing as well. You get this little interactive guide. But I can't wait to get around it before I do. The first thing that struck me as I walk through the door is this wonderful uh, display or mural up on the wall. If you look at that, it is the evolution of a road. So it starts off uh, with a corner shop in the early 1900s. It then goes through to the uh, 30s and 40s and 50s and 60s and then 80s, look, Blockbuster. And then got your Sainsbury's local. And all the cars that you see on that display are actually in this museum. So uh, we get to see them as we walk around. I can't wait. Oh, wow! Look at this place. As far as the eye can see in this amazing building, there is the best of British. What a thrill it's gonna to be to walk around this place on carpet as well, nice and comfortable, very closeted with these amazing posters around. Oh, I'm gonna have a great afternoon. But the man who put all this together is Richard Usher. Richard, uh, like thank you very much for having me down here today. I really do appreciate it. Uh, so Richard, tell me a little bit, because I gather it's, there's so much to tell, it's gonna be a long story. <laughs> so just give me a synopsis about what people can see when they come down here. Well, you, you sort of summed it up really, the, the best of British and of course some of the worst of British as well, but this is a sort of celebration of what we as Brits did to put people on the road. And I think it's important because it's a story that is being forgotten. You know, that we made cars in such huge volumes that were exported all, all over, over the world. All over the world, yeah. Um, so here we got the best of British. It's all laid out in a really clear and easy way to navigate as well. And you've got this lovely little interactive device that people will get when they get to reception uh, that will guide them through the display and the collection. Well, I think it's sort of important as well that we, we, we tune into nostalgia. And I think we're in quite nostalgic times because we've all been locked up for a very long time. Um, and so, you know, one of the hopes is it's not just for car enthusiasts. I think car enthusiasts will love it, but it's, it's also for people to come along and look at that and say, oh God, my Uncle Alfred had one of those. You know, I remember going so-and-so. And, -so and you know, there we have that amazing pink miner, you know, celebrating the millionth one produced, as you can see behind you. Um, and again, you're just a great story that uh, the first car in the UK to a million it's fantastic isn't it isn't that good but it's not only restricted which is the one unique USP about this fabulous fabulous thing that you put together this isn't only restricted to us walking around looking at cars on carpet dreaming one day that we could drive one of these cars actually you are letting people drive some of the cars aren't you yeah well we're on a as you can see quite an interesting site it's it's an old forge and then it was a big wire works and we're lucky we've got a, we've got some private roads so we're, we're doing this um, this driving experience that we call drive dad's car and the idea is that you know you go back to those analog days of motoring when you had to pull the choke out and churn away on the starter and wind the windows down and and all that kind of stuff that again we we're, we're fast forgetting aren't we just get in the car now push a button and off it goes yeah and you can what just jump in any car as their collection of cars that people have got to have a ride in there are 32 cars on the drive fleet and you you have an instructor with you so he tells you when to put the choke in and he warns you that the brakes probably aren't quite <laughs> the, the same as your modern car brakes um, and they, the car's got cameras in as well so it's all sort of recorded for you so, oh, you, fantastic. so you, you, we call that the trip down memory lane which is exactly what it is for most people the doors are open uh, you're inviting people back down there. Do people need to book or can they just turn up on the day? Well, obviously with COVID, it's much better if you do book and, and our website has time slots on it. Um, I mean, obviously we're not, I don't think we'll be busy all the time. So if you do just drop in, we'll try and slot you in when we can. And hopefully we get out of this terrible situation in June and we'll, we can throw the doors wide open. Gotcha, okay. So when people arrive, uh, make sure they booked, make sure they w uh, wear a face mask, bring a face yeah, mask. Yeah, people will be social distancing, face masks, 
we'll have hand stations all over the place, or all, all the stuff, you know, because obviously the last thing we want to do is to be part of any kind of infection. So. Gotcha. So Richard, uh, thank you very much for having me down here today. I can't wait to uh, show the people there around this amazing facility and this thing that you put together. So chapter one, this is Austin, and for good reason. Austin is a bit of a local hero around these parts, and particularly a hero uh, to the curator of this, Richard, who, who does love uh, uh, Mr. Austin, and he's got an amazing story to tell. So Richard told me to take the device, go up and scan the QR code, and then it's gonna give me a little story about this car. This is a very special car. So this is a very, very early Austin 7. Um, this was owned by a district nurse, one owner from New, believe it or not, owned by a district nurse. It's only done 33,000 miles from New and it's been completely restored. And uh, Richard then went and tracked down Mr. Austin's house, which is this beautiful place that you can see behind me, this lovely house, and uh, asked permission to put this little Austin on the drive of that house. And that's all explained in this interactive part of the display. Also, on the right-hand side of the front door, just there, is the billiard room. And that picture that you're looking at there is the drawing of the first Austin 7 that Mr. Austin and his son would have done on the billiard table in that room. And then the rest of it, as you know, is history. And that's just chapter one. There's plenty more to go and see. So chapter two is all about Morris. Now Morris was the great rival to Austin, also a great innovator and a fantastic guy who was Oxford based and that's why we have the Morris Oxford. Uh, now what he did was he bought the second great British car to the market after the Austin 7, the first one. Uh, we can dare say that this was the second great British car, which is the Morris Minor. Now I'm standing next to this one. This is the millionth Minor. And I've just discovered something that I never knew before. They actually made 360 of these millionth miners that they distributed to their dealer network. And on the side, there's a little badge that says Miner Millionth, which is absolutely lovely. But another little thing that I just think is charming, and I just found this out myself, using the interactive app, it's so good, uh, which is when this car was originally designed by Alec Isagonis, he came into the design studio one morning, stood at the front of it, and he said, do you know what? I think this car needs to be four inches wider. And of course, all the draftsmen, all the engineers put their heads in their hands, and they went, oh no, what's he doing? But that's why on the very early uh, Morris Miners, there's a gap in the bumper, and there's his plate down here. And that's why we have this stripe that comes up and across the top of the bonnets, because they just had to widen it four inches. Didn't matter about the windscreen, that was just glass, they could widen that in the rest of the car. But isn't that interesting? I just found that out today, they had to widen the car four inches because Alex Isagonis thought it looked better. And as we know, Alex Isagonis went on to much better things thereafter. So now we're gonna move on to chapter three, and this bit is really exciting because it's the swinging 60s, and you can see color everywhere, all in the advertising campaigns. Everything was about optimism and getting out there and enjoying yourself, and you've now got some disposable income. What did they say? We've never had it so good in the 60s. And this is where Alec Isagonis really come into his own because we end up with the Mini. And the Mini, it's fair to say, wasn't, believe it or not, a great seller at the beginning. It was only when they put it in the hands of Princess Margaret, who was dating at the time, that uh, she was the royal couple and everyone was looking at what she was doing. And they were going, I like that car. She's driving it, it must be good. And then you got Twiggy and the Beatles and everyone jumps into them, so everyone wants one. And then I think we start to become complacent and I'll explain why, because Alec is a bonus. He designed not only the Morris Minor, he designed the Mini, he also did the Austin 1100, which is basically a stretch Mini. Biggest selling cars so far in the United Kingdom. But they become complacent because the small cars they were selling but they weren't that popular in terms of where they were going next with their cars because they were just small cars and they weren't looking at the frets over their shoulder from the likes of Vauxhall and also from these guys, the Giants, Ford, who was actually listening to their customers. And although this Mark I Escort, this is a 72, the Mark I Escort was derived in 1967 and you're saying in 67, 
from an early Mini, look how much bigger the cars are getting and people just wanted space. They wanted simplicity, simplicity. And that's where you end up with posters like this saying, take your family out, go and have fun, explore the great outdoors and do it in a Ford Escort. And of course, this car and the Vauxhall, they sold them by the bucket load. So this is really interesting and uh, I'm getting all of this from this lovely interactive device. Uh, the Escort, okay, 1967. This is a 1971 uh, Morris 1800. Okay, so this car is newer than that more modern looking Escort. You can see where they're starting to go wrong. This car is not forward thinking, it's backwards thinking. Not only that, it's a shame, but this car was designed by none other than Alex Zagonis again. And this is really his downfall because this car was too complicated. Front wheel drive, hydroelastic suspension, uh, it's big, it's not that good looking, it's too backwards looking and not forward thinking. Uh, so that's not a great car. They were trying with cars like this, this is a, a rebadged Marina, basically it's a, a Morris Ital, as it says there, not very Italian. And it isn't, I actually had one of these, a little Morris Ital, I don't want to tell you why I had one, but I did have one. But really interesting, you can chart the sort of rise and the success of British cars and then you can start to see where once you put Rover and Triumph and all these other manufacturers and throw them into the melting pot it all starts to go it's a shame a little bit wrong see these two lovely characters here I like these two these are the Roots brothers and they got such an interesting story to tell I don't want to reveal it all because you should learn it yourself when you come to this wonderful facility but basically you've got Billy and you've got Reggie they were car dealers okay and as car dealers uh, they had to sell cars and they sold as many Austins and uh, uh, Morrises as they could get their hands on in fact they sold so many they couldn't get any more uh, so what do they do as car dealers they think how ah, can we get some more cars to sell I know let's buy some factories so they bought Sunbeam, Hillman, Singer and Humber they bought all of those uh, factories and those companies and they put them all together and they started to produce some amazing cars. And they actually grew the biggest independent uh, car manufacturing company in Britain at the time after the great two, you know, Morris and Austin. Um, but believe it or not, the whole thing fell over like a pack of cards. Guess when the British government got involved over the building of this, the Hillman Imp. They wanted to build the car in Coventry and the British government said they had to build the car in Scotland. And uh, that's the car that created the demise of the two fantastic Roots Brothers. What a shame. The mid eighties. This is my time of getting in the motor trade. These are the cars that you're gonna see coming up that I started to sell, they're brilliant. Uh, but this one's caught my eye straight away. About 1986, 87, it's a Vauxhall Astra. But what's really cute about this one, it's a 1.3L clearly they couldn't sell 1.3 l's so they thought how can we get them out the showroom we've got loads of them sitting in fields i know let's put celebrity on the side and give some things away like a sliding tiltable glass sunroof a rear spoiler because you need a rear spoiler with a 1.3 tinted glass and windscreen shade band electric clock that was an extra and cigar lighter also an extra cigars uh, but this is nice special white wheel covers and the driver's seat is height adjustable there's an e miss in there and this is taken from the original uh, pamphlet side moldings and look at the price six thousand six hundred thirty eight pound so they put all that stuff on to try and get it out the showroom and still charge you for it but this is one of my favorite cars big seller back in the day the mark III escort i have plenty of those then we move on to voxels which are lovely we got this but i want to get to this one because this is the Sierra, and I don't know what colour this is, it's like a brown, a maroon, it's a really funky colour isn't it, it really is. Jelly Moulds car, plastic front and rear bumpers, huge fleet seller, and the main competitor to this car was sat alongside it here, which is the Vauxhall Cavalier, or the Chavalier, and again look at that colour, these are the colours we hankered for back in the 80s, I can remember selling those two cars just like that. Uh, but early Vauxhall cars are really nice as well, like this little Vauxhall Viva, that lovely poster for the Vauxhall Viva, look at that, gay romantic Viva. All comes from a different period of time, same colour again on the Chevette, that car's only done 4,000 miles, very 
uh, unusual car. And then we got this lovely Cortina Estate car, Ford. You can see her really coming into her own uh, once you get cars like this Cortina Estate. But the one that really gets me here in this little section, right here, Mark 1 Ford Transit, little motorhome, something for you and the family to go away in. It's got a pop top, it's got a cooker, it's got a sink, it's got beds. It's the proper little staycation uh, vehicle to go away and enjoy the British countryside. Absolutely love that. So we can start to tell that there's a little bit of chaos in the British car industry. Ford seems to have sorted themselves out. They've got four cars. They've got the Escort, the Capri, the Cortina, and the Granada. That's it. But British Leylands, they've got like 20 cars. And they're all competing with each other. And then British Leylands give us cars like the TR7. Some of my friends don't like TR7s. I actually don't mind them. Uh, but this is almost a little bit unforgivable, and it's the Austin Allegro. And I'm going to take it for why. Because the silly things like this, you're looking at a beautiful new car from Austin. And you're simply not, are you? That's not a beautiful new car from Austin. If you look at the car next to it, which is an Austin 1100 uh, that Alex Isagonis had designed, it's beautiful, as opposed to this that was designed by some guy in Birmingham who really didn't care. And that's the shame of it. And then you've got this hideous monstrosity next door, which is the Vandam Pla with this ridiculous grille and leather interior. Uh, this car was built specifically for people that were gonna travel 3,000 miles a year and just didn't really like cars. And that's where you can see it all starts going wrong for British Leyland. Too many cars, not inspiring enough, competing against each other, where other manufacturers have got it on points. It's like the plug hole's been pulled and the water's draining away. It's quite sad, really. So the 80s are continuing and it's getting even brighter and more optimistic. The shoulder pads are out, the hair's getting bigger, pop socks are on their way, and we get cars like this, the wonderful Austin Mini Metro. This is a direct replacement for the Mini, of which they never stopped selling, so they still make that at the same time but this is a very early car 1981 uh, was the very early cars for the austin mini metro give one of these to princess diana people buy it by the bucket load they sold two and a half million but part of the problem was by the time we get to one of the last cars this is 1997 look not much has changed it's fundamentally the same car it never really evolved that much it would have been nice to see a lot of change but uh, one of the things that's really interesting about this is the fact that there's a Mini lurking in the corner. You know why? Because even when this car was out selling two and a half million, they were still selling Minis. Then we've got really good cars, and I mean good cars, like this, the Maestro. I actually like the Maestro. Great car. Next to it is a Montego, also a very good car. They were there to compete with the likes of the Astra and the Escort. But I'm going to tell you, the reason why they didn't really work nothing to do with a car the cars are not that bad in themselves it's to do with a dealer network they simply didn't know who they were were they Austin were they Morris were they Triumph were they something else what were they meant to be doing and it was all a bit of a mess come this time but look how nice that car is very nice but that journey continues because we've got cars like Rover which then becomes MG MGs they're still being made in England, still being made in Longbridge and around Birmingham. This Bentley, they're still being made in Crewe. Uh, this actual Bentley here belongs to that chap, Mr. Elton John. Uh, that was his personal Bentley. And of course, McLaren. Look at that, right up to date. Volcanic orange McLaren, just wonderful. And they are producing 12 new models in a five year span. So you can see this great British car journey takes in a whole heap of information all the way down and it really is an amazing facility to come down and just browse and walk through and i've just given you a snapshot of some of the cars here there's cars on the fringes and all over the place plus you get a driver car if you want to don't forget it's got a really good restaurant but book your tickets make sure you get your little interactive guide you can find out all the information the greatbritishcarjourney.com you can find them across all forms of social media and my recommendation is book early to avoid disappointment because this place is well worth a visit and enjoy it.